and turn to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. And I'm preaching today on the subject, how to raise children in a racially turbulent time. How do you raise children? How do you parent in a racially turbulent time? And all of us are aware of that. It seems not only the pandemic, we see racial division, uh, we, we see a lot of unrest in our nation today. And so how do you raise children? I told Reggie a moment ago, I thought about retitling it, uh, how do, you, how do you parent or how do you raise colorblind kids? When I was uh, in, the, in officer school, I was at Fort Sam Houston, and I wanted to get into flight school, and so I was taking the visual test, the eye exams, and the guy looked at me and he said, uh, you're colorblind. He said, you cannot distinguish between green and yellow. And because of that, I failed and I was not able, I wasn't able to fly or to go to flight school. Um, I guess you need to know the difference between go and caution when you're flying a, a fighter jet. So uh, anyway, I didn't make it. But you know, how do you, how do you raise children in, in these times? Uh, one of my favorite movies is Remember the Titans. And in that movie is the story of a period of time when schools were racially integrating. And if you've ever watched this movie, Denzel Washington plays the main role, uh, Coach Boone. And uh, it's, a, it's an unbelievable movie. I love this movie. And it, there comes a point in the movie when they're in a game and there is an African-American player on the offense that doesn't play well or does something wrong, and so Boone throws, pulls him out of the game. The white coach, the assistant, goes over, wraps his arm around this, this black athlete and talks to him for a minute and then puts him back in on defense. Now, you have to understand, in football, the head coach is the final word. So the white coach, in some ways, had kind of overruled Coach, coach Boone. And Denzel Washington, who played this part, looks at this white coach afterwards, and he basically says this, because the white coach says, well, I guess you want to thank me. He says, thank you. No, I don't want to thank you at all. And Denzel Washington went on to make this statement. He said, I may be a mean cuss, but I'm the same mean cuss with everybody on that field, black or white. And I want you to know something. That's the man of God. Now, that's me. My nearly 65 years of life, I, I'm the same. Uh, I haven't changed. I preached a while back on race relations in a sister church. And afterwards, a woman came up to me who was a member of a church down in Natchez where I preached a revival. And she looked at me and laughed, said, Brother Jeff, you haven't changed. You're exactly the way you were down in Natchez. Now, how do you raise children to be colorblind? How do you raise children in a racially turbulent world not to judge people based on the color of their skin, but as Dr. King said, by the content of their character? What is the key? And how do you do it? Well, Proverbs chapter 22 is a great verse, and let's read it together. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, Solomon, and we believe Sil Solomon, the wisest man in the world, was phrasing this. And he says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Now, the word in the Hebrew, train up, means to hedge in. So, parent, what you're doing is you're hedging in your child and you're aiming them in a certain direction. So you're hedging, you're training up. So you train up a child in the way he should go, in the way you want him to go, in the way you believe God would have you to lead them in the certain direction that you're trying to lead them in the way they should go. And when he's old, now everybody look this way. In the Hebrew, that means bearded chin. In other words, when that child gets to puberty and hair starts sprouting all over their body, and for a young man right there on that chin, that little bit of stubble on his chin, 
what it is saying in the turbulent teenage years, you will not lose your child. They will not depart from how you have trained them and how you pointed them. So let, let me read it again, then we'll pray. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. He shall not depart from it. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you. Lord, cleanse me, forgive me. Of anything that's come out of my mouth, anything that's come across my mind, Lord, anything that's come before my eyes, dear Lord, let me be a tool in your hand and give you the glory and honor. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want you to be seated. Number one, let me give you four quick points. Number one, racism, listen, racism is hate. Okay? Racism is hate. And I, I wrote this down. Hate is the most dangerous component that can be brought into the life of your child. Let me tell you, the most difficult people for me to share the gospel with are people that are filled with racial hatred, black or white. So in other words, racism is hatred. It's hate. And hate is the most dangerous component that can come into the life of your child. So let me say to parents, parents, you are trying to guard your child from prejudice, bigotry, and racial hatred. That's one of your primary things as a parent because once hatred, no matter what form it comes in, once it comes into the life of your child, it makes it far more difficult for the Holy Spirit to bring that heart to salvation. Did you hear that say amen? You know, I watch parents today. A lot of parents are very guarded. They're wearing masks. All the kids are wearing masks. Babies are wearing masks. But did you know today, right now in this nation, there is a far more dangerous illness that is sweeping our land? It's a renewed, present racial hatred. And so you as a parent are in a very difficult place. And let me say this. Hate is not... Racism is not only hatred. Hate breeds hate. When you get around people that are filled with hate, you'll find that beginning to affect your life. Let me give you an example. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15, listen to what Paul said if he wrote Hebrews. Make every effort, listen to this, to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now listen to this. See to it, parent, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. In other words, somebody, your child, could fall short of God's grace and salvation if you are not careful in a root of bitterness. And the word bitter is picros in the Greek. It's sticky anger. You ever met somebody that they're just angry and it's just stuck to them? So racism is hatred, and hate breeds hate. And parent, you're working extremely hard to ensure that your child doesn't develop a root of bitterness because if they do, it can not only cause them to fall short of the grace of God, it can also affect their salvation, their eternity. MacArthur, John MacArthur, John MacArthur has been very strong. Uh, he's been really strong about some of the things that are going on in America. But John MacArthur, John MacArthur met with black pastors and students. In other words, in, in the church and in a seminary, which, is, uh, which he started, his church is affiliated with. He met with black students and black pastors, and he asked this question. He said, what can this church and this academic institution do for you? What can we do right now in the midst of this racial unrest? Listen to what these students said and these pastors. Number one, racism. They wanted John MacArthur to be unapologetic. Number one, we want you to say that racism is a sin. Number two, have compassion on those who have suffered because of racism. Number three, listen. Listen. Number four, Use these days to show the love of Christ. Use these days to show the love of Christ. Number five, 
He said that, they said this, the only thing that will break this cycle in the African-American community, they said, was to have God help us, they said to John MacArthur and to an institution, a seminary institution, help us to develop and disciple godly fathers in our, among our people. And then John MacArthur said, why? Why were they asking that? Because black or white, we're in a holocaust, black or white. 25 million children today are without a dad in this country. 40% of children grades 1 through 12 are without a dad. 50% of the births that are born are without a dad. 85% of prisoners today grow up in fatherless homes. 85% of children with behavioral problems come from fatherless homes. 90% of runaways come from fatherless homes. 300% more likely your child will be to get involved, in get involved in drugs and weapons if they are without a dad. And MacArthur said, these young black students, black pastors said, we are in a holocaust. And MacArthur said, both black and white are in a holocaust in this country today. So number one, racism is hate. Number two, hate will endanger your child's soul. I cannot say it enough. Listen to this statement. There is a strong possibility that once prejudice and racial hatred seep into the soul of your child, it can, and over time, harden the heart of your child to the love of God. They begin to become hardened to the love of God. Listen, God is love. It doesn't say God is grace, God is faith. It says God is love. The very character and the nature of God is love. You and I never look more like God than when we love our fellow man. And we never look more like our enemy when we hate. And you can't hide prejudice. You can't hide it. I can tell you, as a white man nearly 65 years old, if I'm around a black man or woman... And I know they, do, they have racism in their heart. They can't hide it from me. Holy Spirit will alert me. My guard is up. If you're a black man or woman, you know when you're around somebody who's white and they're racist and filled with hate. Why? Because that's the very opposite of the character and the nature of the indwelling Holy Spirit. God is love, the Bible says. You know what the Bible says? If you, hate your bud, uh, if you hate your brother, you dwell in darkness. He that loveth not knoweth not God. We're to love our enemy. We are to do good to those who persecute us. In the time of Jesus, law enforcement was, was Roman soldiers. A Roman soldier could look at a Jew and say to him, you're to take my armor and carry it one mile. Oh, also this, if they didn't say Caesar is Lord, a Roman soldier could take their head off right there on the spot. They were required to carry the armor, the provisions of a Roman soldier, bullied. You know what Jesus said? He said, when they ask you to go one mile, which was required by law, offer to the Roman soldier to go a second mile. You see, your enemy, parent, your enemy, Satan, is trying to introduce into your child's life a cancer that will affect them their whole life, and that is racial hatred, and just hate, period. And once it takes root, it is hard to overcome. Now, I'm telling you, I've been in ministry about 40 years. I've been in ministry, and hey, listen, I've been fighting this racial battle more than, um, uh, longer than most of, many of you have been alive. But racism, hatred will affect your child's ability to be saved. Did you hear that? Thirdly, racially charged language, the N-word. You know, I don't think I've ever said the N-word. I don't think I've ever said it. Now, let me tell you, I grew up in a home in a day. I understand, remember, the Titans because that's how I grew up. 
I remember when integration took place in the seventh grade. I remember when it took place in the eighth grade. I remember in the ninth grade being bussed over into the African-American community. I remember my teachers, my coaches, all of a sudden very great diversity. Hey, let me tell you something. The greatest teacher I ever had, Mrs. Lee, an African-American English teacher. I gave her so much trouble, she said, listen, I need everybody to listen. I need you. I tell you, I was speaking Friday and people were distracted and you know what I did? Closed my Bible, prayed and left. You're hearing a word from God today and you need to listen. But I grew up in a time, Miss Lee was my favorite teacher. When I left, she, put a, her, she said, I'm putting your desk right by my desk where it sat a lot in the ninth grade, she said, because God's going to use you. Wow. Willie Washington played for the NBA three years. Coach Washington, a dear, dear picture of what I wanted to be in a young man growing up. Racially charged language parent is inappropriate in the mouth of a believer. If I had ever said the N-word, let me show you what would have happened. This is my dad. It was seen as profanity, inappropriate. When somebody uses that word around me, I either walk away or immediately correct them. But let me tell you, I don't like Coon. I don't like Cracker. I don't like Uncle Tom. I don't like any of it. Because I know where it comes from. It comes from the pit of hell. You see, parent, you're, you're, on, you're on high alert. And when you hear racially charged language, as your children are developing and growing, your response should be this. Everybody look, listen. Your response should be this. Where did you hear that? I remember one time sitting at the table. I let out a four-letter word. And man, it was like ice water fell on the table. We, I got, th I got uh, uh, two sisters and a brother, mom and dad. We were all seated at the table eating supper when all of a sudden I let out a four-letter word because my sister did something, and it was like somebody threw... I dropped the temperature about 50 degrees immediately in the dining room. Everybody stopped dead silence, and dad said, my dad said, where did you hear that? Where did you hear that word? He said, I'll never forget. He said, son, you say that again and I'll take you to the bedroom. You want to guess what happened? My sister couldn't resist that. She's down in Florida right now where she lives, and she's probably watching this live stream. Shame on you for getting your brother into trouble. She did. I let that four-letter word out again. My dad grabbed me up. We went back to the bedroom, and he wore my tail out. You see, when your child uses profanity and racially charged language is profanity, it's offensive, it's out of the pit of hell. When it comes out of the mouth of your child, your response should be as a parent, where did you hear that? You know why you're asking that? You're trying to identify the source. My dad identified the source. You remember me talking about nearly drowning in the second grade? The kid that taught me the four-letter word just about got me drowned. Taught me a lot of other stuff, too. My dad rescued me because of a four-letter word. You're, what you're doing when you say, where did you hear that? You're trying to identify the source. Is, is this extended family? Let me tell you, on the racial issue, we have, broke, we have broke ties with families, family members. We have, listen, we have skipped family gatherings. We have had, we have had strong confrontations with our own flesh and blood over the race issue. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring you peace. I came to bring a sword. When you do that, you're, got, you're trying to identify this extended family. Uh, is this a friendship? Is this peers? Is this the friend of my child? Is it, my, is it the, your friends? Is it your friends? Is it some of your family? Is it social media? I believe Facebook's going to be the demise of America. I believe the prince of the air, as the Bible calls him, has literally made us... You know the song a moment ago about the ocean and storm? You know what the Bible says before the second coming of Jesus Christ? It says that the ocean will be turbulent. And the word ocean there is for humanity. Is humanity turbulent right now? Is there unrest? 
hey, you can get ready. It may be Jesus that's getting ready to come back. Entertainment figures, music, sports, Hollywood, anybody. Listen, LeBron James' picture sits on the floor in my office because years ago, LeBron James left about a 1,000 kids in Jackson with nowhere, he, he just mistreated inner with it. And I took his picture off my wall, put it on the floor, and it's been there ever since. Sometimes you and I have to identify and we have to remove those sources of influence. In the, it could be a TV program your children are watching. Number four, how do you counter the present culture of racial hatred? How do you do it? As a parent, how do you do it? Number one, listen to me very closely. Parent, introduce into your children's life great voices of social change. First of all, Jesus. Introduce your children to Jesus. Help them to see what a radical figure he was in history. He was unbelievable. He was a friend of wine-bibbers and gluttons. He was, a, he, he was love personified. Let, introduce them to Jesus. Let them read the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. Introduce them to the, to the figure, historical figure, that most affected King's life, Gandhi, and how he handled social change among the British in India. Read Nelson Mandela, A Long Walk to Freedom or A Long Walk Home. Learn, he introduced them to Mother Teresa. In other words, introduce your children to figures, historical figures that led to reform and change. And my friend, before we rip down all the monuments and statues in this country, we may need to ask what they're there for. Alexander Hamilton was a great abolitionist. He wrote the Federalist Papers. He was one of the framers of this Constitution. He was an adamant opposition against slavery. He was killed in a duel with the vice president, Aaron Burr, who was a slave owner. His wife lived to be 93, 97 years old. She was 50, she was 50 years old. She was 50 years a widow. When she died, she was caring for the children of slaves. Be sure before you tackle our history that you don't take a moment to ask about some of these figures because some of them have stood and given their life for the abolition movement. Introduce your children to great voices of social change. Secondly, counter with black and white men you know personally. If you begin to, you know, when I begin to listen to some of this stuff and I feel a tinge of prejudice come into me, you know what I immediately do? I bring up Russell and Bell. I bring up Daniel. Up to my mind comes Willie. I think about some of our black men and women in this church, men and women who, are, and then ultimately, let me tell you, my, my secret weapon, I believe, is Midian Chitsede, that pastor in Zimbabwe. I believe if Midian died right now, we got word of it. All four of my children at great risk of their life and health, I believe all four of my children and Sheila and I would be on a plane to bury that black African man who has so affected our life. Introduce your children to people of integrity, godly men and women. Let them build those friendships, and that will counter the prejudice and the hate that may be creeping up in you right now. Don't watch the news. Get off Facebook. Take a break from it. Build relationships with men and women who don't look like you. Thirdly, counter with truth and equity. You know, our responsibility right now is to help children process as they're growing up a very complicated world. Do you do that? If you're going to watch the news, whether you're watching CNN or Fox, do you take time as a parent to stop the news or, or put it on mute and say, let's talk about this for a moment. I wrote this down. As a parent, you want to tell the truth about an issue. You don't want to be unbiased, and you don't want to be unequitable. As Boone said, I'm the same cuss no matter who I am around. If something's wrong, it's wrong. 
George Floyd. When George Floyd was killed by a law enforcement officer who sat with his knee as if he were sitting there with a prized deer that he had shot. While a man was choking and dying under his knee and he was sitting there with a hand in his pocket as if he was posing for a picture. That was a horrible injustice in this country. And it awakened us. It reminded us of something that so often we have not heard. But if I'm sitting there and that is coming across my TV and my children are trying to figure this out and they see anger, my responsibility as a parent is to help them understand why that death was not right, why that was a horrible injustice. What am I to tell them? We don't have it in here. I'm to tell them, first of all, the United States flag of America stands for freedom and the right to law, the due process of law, the right to be represented, the right to be tried and tried before your peers. Every privilege that the United States flag stands for, George Floyd was denied. I'm helping my child process all of this social upheaval, and I'm helping them understand. When I watched... Uh, Rayshard, Rayshard uh, Brooks, the man who was killed in Atlanta. There's a picture of him sitting in, in the seat and he's just looking up. And when I saw that picture, I begin, my tears begin to come to my eyes. How that man died was an injustice, should have never happened. And you know, black or white, isn't it strange? Black or white, I don't know anybody that doesn't believe that. Maybe I just need to hang around some different people. But before you're too hard on the blue, let me remind you of something. Law enforcement, you're, you, hate, you hate cops? You believe they're all bad cops? Let me tell you, I'm a preacher. You know how many jokes I've heard? You know how often people have been derogatory, insensitive? You know how much stuff I've put up with all through these years? You know how many people have joked about preachers being rich, working an hour a week, driving a fancy car? You know how many times I've listened to all that and you know how untrue it is and how many pastors are not those on TV that are drawing million dollars and flying in jet airplanes? You know, most of us are not. We're, we're, we're like you. We're just trying to make ends meet. Do you hate cops? I asked Therese, I said, Therese, Therese did a great job of putting together a story, kind of where we are culturally. Right now, there are over 800,000 police officers on any given day in this country. In a year, 375 million contacts, averaging less than 1,000 deaths in 375 million contacts between police and people. The number one killer of police officers, anybody want to guess? Suicide. The number one killer of law enforcement police officers, suicide. The average lifespan of a, of a police officer, 57 years. It's 12 years less than the lowest figures. Retirement, if they make it to retirement, they die less than five years after retirement. Big money, Jackson Police Department makes about $34,000 package a year. $34,000 a year for JPD. You hate police? Then you're sinning. Because that's as much, there's hate and hating law enforcement just like there's hate in black and white. Hate is alien to the belief and to the structure of a Christian. We don't do that. Do we need reform? Do we need reform? Yes, we do. I've sat with people, some of the most powerful people, and I've said this. I said, you've got to go into the academies. You've got to retrain. You've got to give psychiatric exams about every six months to police officers because of the stress that they're under. I think that's true for preachers. I think we need a psychiatric exam about every six months. 
There needs to be the firing of administration when they have knowledge of repeated violations. In other words, the man who killed George Floyd should have been dealt with years ago. He had 17 offenses. The administration had allowed him to continue. They should not have. There should be body cam on every, every police officer. There should be the freedom to begin to fix the problem. So all of that is part of it. But here's the big one. I want you to listen closely. Everybody, I want you to miss this one. I cannot excuse my prejudice, my bigotry, my racial hatred because of my experiences or the experiences of those in my family that I love. It still does not justify me hating anybody. Can't do it. Parent, children cannot be allowed to have racist attitudes. And you may say, well, how do you know that? Hey, listen, anytime you sum up somebody as a color, anytime you sum up those white people, those black people, my friend, at that point, that's a racist statement right there, and you've got a problem. Can't do it. Hatred, prejudice, bigotry, because of a bad experience in your life or somebody that you love does not justify you hating anybody. Can't do it. And let me say something else here, and listen. And, and let me say this. A lot of times people say, well, I've had a bad experience with the law. Three out of four of my children have had bad experiences with the law. One of them had such a bad experience with law enforcement, I was so angry that I went to the precinct and I probably could have gotten arrested. But I, said, I, I wrote this down. Listen, no one in this church has the right nor the credentials to encourage the public processing of your feelings, emotions in the public arena. Nobody. Anybody, anybody that says, well, I think this is necessary, this needs to take place. No, it does not. Because it hurts innocent people. It divides the church. It's a tool of the enemy, tool of Satan. You know what the Bible said? In Matthew 18, 15 through 19, you know what the Bible tells us? When we have a difference, it doesn't tell us to go into the public arena. The Bible tells us to go to an individual privately, share our heart. The Bible says if, you, if they won't hear you, take somebody with you. And the Bible says even within that, you're to do it within the body of the church, not out in the public arena. My friend, most of us need to get off Facebook for a while, and we need to stay off of it until things settle down. Be careful, parent, of those who give permission for your child to hate and call it processing or working through their emotions. You may say, well, how do I do it as a parent? What do I do? You, come, you want your children to come to you. You know, my kids, and even now, we, we talk about racial issues, but we talked about it all the way up. Listen, they're, listen they were getting the... They were getting, hey, listen, how many people, uh, two Sundays ago, I had hate mail on my desk. When you open a letter and it starts with dickhead, you know it's not going to be good. How many people in this church have the police department watching their home? Thank you, Therese. <laughs> you probably do. Be careful of those who give permission to your child for them to process in the public arena. That's not scriptural, that's not correct. And there's no excuse for it. Your children should come to you privately. They should say, I'm having problems. And if you as a parent cannot help your child process that, work through that, then that's what Reggie and I are here, and only us two. You come to your pastor's. And you may say, well, you know, you just don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what I've endured. You don't know what it is to be my color. You don't know what it is to deal with the things that I've dealt with. You don't know what my children have gone through. That's right. And you don't know what I've gone through either. Sheila was run off the road right here on the interstate. She was run off the road. She blinked her lights. 
The individual blocked her on the interstate, dead stop, got out and pulled the gun on her and on your worship leader when he was a boy. I blinked my lights, three people in a car slammed on brake, stopped at 70 miles an hour, dead stop, and one of them put his finger out there and did this. church secretary in this church was dragged across a parking lot of Walmart. Senior adult who lived on Gibraltar dragged for her purse. Jeanette Price, two weeks ago, they were shooting like the Wild West drug territory. Gangs and drugs all up and down there, senior adult. My son-in-law, noonday, up here, had three people jump him, one dragging his dragging him while he was clinging to his blower, and the other one trying to get a bead to get a shot, and a woman saying, laughing and shouting at noontime in a main boulevard, shoot the SOB. I understand. You see, sometimes when we get filled with hatred and racism, we begin to think we're the only ones that are suffering. That's what's wrong in this country. When I was in my first church, dear precious family, man and woman, they had a 10-year-old daughter. One day on a Saturday morning, this woman worked the post office on Saturdays. She came to work that day, and on a Saturday morning, the postmaster general called me and said, you need to get down here right now. When I got down there, my church member, one of the most precious people I've ever known, was made to get out on her knees. She had given $223, made to get out on her knees with her head turned away. And a woman shot her in the back of the head because she was filled with hate. Never forget what it felt like. Called down there looking at this scene of cerebral fluid and blood laying there on the floor. This precious, precious thing. Not a mean bone in her body. And then the postmaster general looking at me and saying, you've got to go tell, your, tell her husband and her 10-year-old daughter. You think you've been through a lot of suffering? You think you're justified in your hatred and your bigotry, your racism? You're no more justified than I am. We've all suffered. We've all hurt. And you may say, well, why, Brother Jeff, why are you not prejudiced? And I'm not. I love everybody. Because I can't bring hate into a Holy Spirit-filled vessel. Can't do it. And sometimes when I'm struggling and I'm thinking, God, this is, this is hard. This is discouraging. I haven't slept in nights. I haven't slept in days. We've had diarrhea. We've been sick. We've been up all night. You know why? Because we're asking ourselves the question, will this church survive this? Sheila said, you've given nearly a quarter of a century. Nobody, black, white, rich, poor, nobody is justified as a child of God. And nobody has a right to give permission to anybody to take that hatred and process it in the public arena. That's unscriptural. You know, Willie and I, we were... Willie and Daniel, W.H., we were all sitting in the office talking, and from that conversation, Willie and I, we were going somewhere. We were just driving along, riding along, and... I looked at Willie in the, in the midst of our nation and the racial turbulence, and I, I said, Willie, I said, uh, and, I, and I thought about our city. I thought about our community. And I said, Willie, what are we going to do? And he looked at me, and he said, Brother Jeff, people just need Jesus. That's what he said. And Willie, that was theologically and biblically as sound a statement. America, let me tell you what America needs. America needs Jesus. America needs Jesus. And if you're here today and you say, Brother Jeff, I'm, I'm going to have to admit 
There's been some simmering anger, hatred. I've been wrestling and struggling with prejudice, feelings that I don't like. And you may need to come to this altar. And it doesn't necessarily mean if you come to this altar, that's your problem. You may want to come to this altar and pray for this nation. Because I'm going to tell you something, folks. She's the greatest nation in the world. And never forget it. And if you don't know that, you haven't been in other places. You did. When you come into the airport and you say, welcome home. And you're an American citizen. Oh, we're faulty. We're flawed. We're still working through. But by the grace of God, we make it. But everybody needs Jesus. Not many baptisms in this church. Thank God for this one today. But I'm going to tell you, folks, we don't win very many here. Work is hard. People need Jesus. People need the Lord. If you're here today and you say, Brother Jeff, uh, I'm not a Christian. You're watching and you're saying, Brother Jeff, I, I've never given my life to Christ. How do I do that? You repent of your sin. Is racism, is hate a sin? Yes, it is. Will it send me to hell? Yes, it will. But if you repent of your sin, do a 180 right now. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Then he can not only set you free of that sin, he can not only make you an overcomer, he can make you a tool and a vessel of his love. Are you a vessel of the love of God? Because that's the key. And you can only be a tool in the hand of God when you're filled with this Holy Spirit. You can only be filled with this Holy Spirit when you repent and put your faith in Him. Have you done that? If you're here today and you're struggling with some resentment, anger, hostility, say, Brother Jeff, I, I don't like the way I feel. I watch the news, I look at Facebook, I, I see things creeping up in me I don't like. Then my friend, quit looking at the news. Sorry, Therese. My friend, quit looking at Facebook. Take a break from it. Spend time in the Word. You know, there's very few people I trust. But I trust Jesus. Spend time with Him. Let me pray for you, and let's stand. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to You, and Lord, as best we can. I thank You, dear Lord, for the quietness and the respect of the people in this sanctuary. Lord, you know my heart. And you know, dear Lord, that we are a nation that, dear Lord, is so divided. But the Bible says, Jesus, you prayed that they may be one even as I and the Father are one. You said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Lord, may we quit going to Facebook. May we quit processing on social media. When May we quit taking our dirty laundry and throwing it out before a lost world. May instead, dear Lord, we go into the prayer closet. May we go into the prayer council of a handful of people. May we say, Brother Reggie, I'm struggling and I, wanna, I want this right in my heart. May we say, Brother Jeff, I want this right in my heart. A man told me this week, told me last week, he said, Brother Jeff, if the enemy ever gets into Southside, Southside Baptist. He said, we're in trouble. And what he felt like was that this, this church, who a long time ago took a stand, 20 years ago took a stand, 2014 took a stand on the flag. Oh, we're not running behind doing stuff that's politically correct. We are a people that have been on the front line, pushing the envelope, going forward guided and directed by vision and purpose. But as that man said, if we ever falter, it'll send a tremor not only across this city, across this state, across this nation, it'll ring around the world. Southside Baptist. So God, I pray right now that you bind the enemy. I pray, dear Lord, if there be anybody that would bring any division, that Lord, you would begin to silence them. I pray, dear Lord, that you would pull us together in the fellowship and the intimacy of the New Testament church. 
I pray, dear Lord, if there's anyone here that's battling with prejudice and hatred or listening right now, that God, you get a hold of their heart. Remove that root of bitterness. And if they say, you don't know what somebody's done to me, you don't know what I've been through, well, it's not any more than what we did to Jesus. And remember, that was a mob that did that. God, we are people of truth. And may we speak the truth in love. But oh, may we speak the truth. God, take this invitation and use it for your glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus.